It's August 6, 1945, and three warplanes are on a secret mission. One of them will be taking photographs, and another will be observing. But the third is carrying a payload that will change the world forever. The aircraft reached their target at 8.14 in the morning. A minute later, the payload is released. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima. Within seconds, the city below is transformed into a wasteland. The nuclear age is born. The atomic bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki helped to bring an end to World War II, but at an unimaginable human cost. It was the first and only time that nuclear weapons had been used. Oppenheimer's Manhattan Project was a success. But what if I told you there was a bombing raid worse than Hiroshima or Nagasaki? An attack that claimed more lives than either of those nuclear blasts. It's been described as the single most destructive air raid in human history. This is the story of the firebombing of Tokyo. By 1944, the tide was turning against the Japanese Empire in the Pacific War. It was rapidly losing territory to the Allies. This included the Mariana Islands, which US troops invaded and captured after some intense fighting. The Mariana are a chain of small islands in the Pacific Ocean. So what do the US want with these tiny islands in the middle of nowhere? Well, they were kind of a big deal. Capturing the Mariana Islands meant that the US military was finally within striking range of the Japanese mainland, including its capital, Tokyo. The battle for the Mariana Islands showed that the Japanese were willing to fight to the death. And not just that, they were prepared to take their own lives rather than be captured by the Americans. In fact, on one of the islands, hundreds of Japanese soldiers and civilians threw themselves off a cliff to avoid being taken as prisoners of war. So the US military built airfields on the Mariana Islands, and in October 1944, a new weapon arrived there, the Boeing B-29 Superfortress. The B-29 was one of the largest and most technologically advanced warplanes of its time. It was also the most expensive to produce, costing $3 billion, even more than the Manhattan Project. The bomber would later be used on the missions to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But there was a specific reason why the B-29 had arrived on the Mariana Islands. Its range of almost 6,000 miles meant it could easily fly to Japan's home islands, strike targets there, and return without refueling. Soon, there were hundreds of them stationed on the Pacific Islands. The US would finally bring the war to the Japanese mainland. The initial targets for the bombers would be factories producing aircraft for Japan's military. And on November 24th, more than 100 B-29 warplanes set off to raid Japan. So the US military's shiny new toy heads to Japan. Billions of dollars in the making with state-of-the-art technology. But if you were expecting a blitzkrieg, you'll be hugely disappointed. The mission was a massive flop. Many of the bombers were running short of fuel and had to turn back. Eight of the warplanes were damaged by enemy fire and one was lost in combat. Of the 111 B-29s that flew to Tokyo, only 35 were able to bomb the main target, the Musashino Aircraft Factory, damaging just 1% of the building. But one of the biggest problems facing the pilots was the weather. The planes dropped their payloads from high altitudes at around 35,000 feet, but at that height, the pilots discovered the jet stream, narrow bands of strong wind that generally blow from west to east, and it was this wind that often pushed bombs away from their targets as they were dropped. And it wasn't just the explosives. The tailwinds from the jet stream also pushed the B-29s so far over their targets that it was almost impossible to release a bomb accurately. It was a problem that the US Air Force had no answer for. Despite these major issues, the bombing raids over Japan continued in the same way. And this went on for another three months, just raid after raid, with very little to show for them. Impatient and frustrated by the lack of results, the American commander in charge of the bombing raids was fired, and his replacement was this guy, 
Curtis LeMay. Now, Major General Curtis LeMay was quite the character. At just 38 years old, he had already earned a reputation as a man that could get things done, especially when it came to the use of warplanes. But he was also known for being fearsome, intense, and relentless. And just to give you an idea of his attitude toward war, he famously once said, I'll tell you what war is about. You've got to kill people, and when you kill enough of them, they stop fighting. Apparently, LeMay was also the inspiration for the cigar-smoking General Jack D. Ripper in Stanley Kubrick's satirical movie, Dr. Strangelove. So after seeing the failures of the high-altitude bombing raids, you think LeMay would try something different, right? But surprisingly, he doesn't. For the next month, he continues with the same tactics. And surprise, surprise, he gets similar results as his predecessor. A month goes by and still no progress. LeMay is stressed out because he knows that if he doesn't get any results worth talking about, he'll likely lose his job. But then something happens in Germany. This is Dresden. Well, the ruins of Dresden anyway. In February 1945, the German city was obliterated by Allied air attacks. Almost 4,000 tons of bombs were dropped on Dresden. This included incendiary devices that caused a firestorm which lasted for days. Dresden literally burned to the ground. And these weren't precision attacks on military targets, the entire city was bombed. The purpose of the assault on Dresden was not only an attempt to force the Nazis to surrender, but also to demoralize the German public. Around 25,000 people lost their lives in the raid, and about 50% of residential buildings were destroyed. Now, the bombing of Dresden was highly controversial. Some questioned the value of targeting the entire city, including Winston Churchill, and others have even called it a war crime. The issue of area bombings and the targeting of civilians is something I'll get into later. So what does this have to do with Japan? Well, the American saw the firebombing of Dresden and how effective it was, and decided to employ the same tactic for Tokyo. They're hoping that if they drop enough bombs on Japan, they will be forced to surrender and bring an end to the war. But it seems they were already planning to use firebombs. Many of Japan's cities at the time were densely populated and most of the buildings were made of wood and paper. The Americans knew this and in 1943, they built mock Japanese houses in Utah. Here they burned down the buildings using various incendiary bombs to test which were most effective. And they found the M69 bomb, which contained napalm, to be the most powerful. The M69 created uncontrollable flames to ensure that firebombs would be effective in a campaign against Japan. The Americans also studied an earthquake that hit Japan in 1923. Fires immediately broke out after the disaster and spread quickly across the cities due to Japan's wooden buildings. The US had found Japan's Achilles heel. But LeMay still had a problem the jet stream. To avoid the strong winds over Japan, he decided to take a radical approach. Instead of deploying the bombers at high altitude, the May will instruct them to go as low as 5,000 feet, and instead of a daytime raid, the B-29s would target Japan in the middle of the night. The May also reckoned it would be much harder for the bombers to be targeted by enemy fire under the cover of darkness. So after much planning and preparation, a massive raid on Tokyo was ready, and it was codenamed Operation Meeting House. On the evening of March 9, 1945, around 300 B-29 bombers took off from the Mariana Islands and headed to Japan. By 12.15, they had reached Tokyo. Hell was about to be unleashed. Whipped by fierce winds, flames detonated by the bombs leaped across a 15-square-mile area of Tokyo, generating immense firestorms that engulfed the city. The people ran through the streets in panic, desperate to find any kind of shelter from the extreme heat, but they wouldn't find any. By now, temperatures in some parts of the city had reached a staggering 1,800 degrees Celsius. Concrete melted, rivers boiled, and glass turned into liquid. The glow of the fire was so bright that it turned night into day. Tokyo burned for days. In just one night, around 100,000 people had lost their lives, 
and a million were left homeless. An estimated 267,000 buildings were burned to the ground. One in every four houses in Tokyo had vanished. The death toll was higher than the atomic bombs of Hiroshima, where an estimated 80,000 people lost their lives in the initial blast. The US strategic bombing survey had this to say about the air raid. Probably more persons lost their lives by fire in Tokyo in a six-hour period than at any time in the history of man. But the firebombing of Tokyo was just the beginning. Encouraged by the destruction of the capital, Curtis LeMay wasted no time and extended the bombing raids to other cities. In the following days, B-29 bombers carried out nighttime firebombing attacks on Japan's largest cities, targeting Nagoya, Osaka and Kobe. Japan had no defense against the raids. But LeMay didn't stop there. He decided to go after Japan's smaller cities and towns too. Over the next two months, all of these towns and cities were firebombed by the US Air Force. And the destruction caused by these raids were just as bad as what happened to Tokyo. Eventually, the US military would firebomb a total of 67 Japanese cities. The bombing raids were so extensive that there was concern that there wouldn't be any targets left for the planned nuclear attacks. By now, you might be wondering, OK, the firebombing raids were so effective, what was the need for the atomic weapons? Well, despite the country being devastated by the B-29 raids and the killing of tens of thousands of civilians, the Japanese government simply refused to surrender. If all else failed, the US did have a plan to invade Japan. But this was something they hoped it would avoid because they predicted it would have cost too many American lives. And even after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Japanese didn't give in. It was only following a rare intervention by the emperor himself that they finally capitulated. When Emperor Hirohito announced the surrender, he referred to a new and most cruel bomb. But according to Japan's former prime minister, Umimaro Konui, the thing that brought about the determination to make peace was the prolonged bombing by the B-29s. Often when we look back at this conflict, we think of the Allies as the good guys and the Axis as the villains. But in reality, every party in the war carried out atrocities. Even Curtis LeMay said that if the Americans had lost the war, he would be tried as a war criminal. It's also worth comparing the reaction to the carpet bombing of Dresden to the destruction of dozens of Japanese cities. Dresden triggered debate and even horror from the public and some politicians. But after Tokyo was bombed into oblivion, there was silence. There were no protests or talk of war crimes. What's interesting is that when World War II broke out in 1939, US President Franklin D. Roosevelt warned against aerial attacks against civilians. But just a few years later, we saw entire cities being reduced to rubble. The firebombing of Japan was arguably more destructive than the atomic bombings at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But that campaign has been largely forgotten and eclipsed due to the new technology introduced by Robert J. Oppenheimer and his team on the Manhattan Project. <laughs>